In the remaining hours before nightfall, I gather rocks and do my best to camouflage the opening of the cave. It's a slow and arduous process, but after a lot of sweating and shifting things around, I'm pretty pleased with my work. The cave now appears to be part of a larger pile of rocks, like so many in the vicinity. I can still crawl into PETA through a small opening, but it's undetectable from the outside. That's good, because I'll need to share that sleeping bag again tonight. Also, if I don't make it back in, back from the feast, PETA will be hidden, but not entirely imprisoned. Although I doubt he can hang on much longer without medicine. If I die at the feast, District 12 isn't likely to have a victor. I make a meal out of the smaller, bonier fish that inhabit the stream down here, fill every water container and purify it, and clean my weapons. I have nine arrows left in all. I debate leaving the knife with Peta so he'll have some protection while I'm gone, but there's really no point. He was right about ca camouflage being his final defense, but I still might have use for the knife. Who knows what I'll encounter. Here are some of the things I'm certain of. That at least Cato, Clove, and Thresh will be on hand when the feast starts. I'm not sure about Foxface, since direct confrontation isn't her style or her forte. She's even smaller than I am un and unarmed, unless she's picked up some weapons recently. She'll probably be hanging somewhere nearby, seeing what she can scavenge. But the other three, I'm going to have my, going to have my hands full. My ability to kill at a distance is my greatest asset, but I know I'll have to go right into the thick of things to get that backpack, the one with the number 12 on it that Claudia's Templesmith mentioned. I watch the sky, hoping for one less opponent at dawn, but nobody appears tonight. Tomorrow, there will be faces up there. Feasts always result in fatalities. I crawl into the cave, secure my glasses, and curl up next to Peta. Luckily, I had that good long sleep today. I have to stay awake. I don't really think anyone will attack our cave tonight, but I can't risk missing the dawn. So cold, so bitterly cold tonight, as if the game makers have sent an infusion of frozen air across the arena, which may be exactly what they've done. I lie next to Peta in the bag, trying to absorb every bit of his fever heat. It's strange to be so physically close to someone who's so distant. Peta might as well be back in the capital, or in District 12, or on the moon right now. He'd be no harder to reach. I've never felt lonelier since the games began. Just accept it, and it will, just accept it will be a bad night, I tell myself. I try not to, but I can't help thinking of my mother and Prim, wondering if they'll sleep a wink tonight. At this late stage in the games, with an important event like the feast, school will probably be canceled. My family can either watch on the static-filled old clunker of a television at home, or join the crowds in the square to watch on the big, clear screens. They'll have privacy at home, but support in the square. People will give them a kind word, a bit of food if they can spare it. I wonder if the baker has sought them out, especially now that Peta and I are a team, and made good on his promise to keep my sister's belly full. Spirits must be running high in District 12. We so rarely have anyone to root for at this point in the games. Surely people are excited about Peta and me, especially now that we're together. If I close my eyes, I can imagine their shouts at the screens urging us on. I see their faces, Greasy Say and Madge, and even the peacekeepers who buy my meat, cheering for us. And Gail. I know him. He won't be shouting and cheering, but he'll be watching every moment, every twist and turn, and willing me to come home. I wonder if he's hoping that Peta makes it as well. Gail's not my boyfriend, but he would he be if I opened that door? He talked about us running away together. Was that just a practical calculation of our chances of survival away from the district? Or something more? I wonder what he makes of all this kissing. Through a crack in the rocks, I watch the moon cross the sky. At what I judge to be about three hours before dawn, I begin final preparations. I'm careful to leave Peta with water and the medical kit right beside him. Nothing else will be of much use if I don't return, and even these would only prolong his life a short time. After some debate, I strip him of his jacket and zip it on over my own. He doesn't need it. Not now in the sleeping bag with his fever, and during the day, if I'm not there to remove it, he'll be roasting in it. My hands are already stiff from cold, so I take Rue's spare pair of socks, cut holes for the fingers and thumbs, and pull them on. It helps anyway. I fill her small pack with some food, a water bottle, and bandages, tuck the knife in my belt, get my bow and arrows. I'm about to leave when I remember the importance of sustaining the star-crossed lover routine, and I lean over and give Peta a long, lingering kiss. I imagine the teary sighs emanating from the capital and pretend to brush away a tear of my own. Then I squeeze through the opening in the rocks out into the night. My breath makes small white clouds as it hits the air. It's as cold as a November night at home, one where I've slipped into the woods, lantern in hand, to join Gale at, the pr at some prearranged place where we'll sit bundled together, sipping herb tea from metal flasks wrapped in quilting, hoping game will pass our way as the morning comes on. Oh, Gale, I think. 
If only you had my back now. I move as fast as I dare. The glasses are quite remarkable, but I still sorely miss having the use of my left ear. I don't know what the explosion did, but it damaged something deep and irreparable. Never mind. If I get home, I'll be so stinking rich, I'll be able to pay someone to do my hearing. The woods always look different at night. Even with the glasses, everything has an unfamiliar slant to it, as if the daytime trees and flowers and stones had gone to bed and sent slightly more ominous versions of themselves to take their places. I don't try anything tricky, like taking a new route. I make my way back up the stream and follow the same path back to Rue's hiding place near the lake. Along the way, I see no sign of another tribute, not a puff of breath, not a quiver of a branch. Either I'm the first to arrive or the others positioned themselves last night. There's still more than an hour, maybe two, when I wriggle into the underbrush and wait for the blood to begin to flow. I chew a few mint leaves. My stomach isn't up for much more. Thank goodness I have Peta's jacket as well as my own. If not, I'd be forced to move around to stay warm. The sky turns a misty morning gray and still there's no sign of the other tributes. It's not surprising, really. Everyone has distinguished themselves either by strength or deadliness or cunning. Do they suppose, I wonder, that I have Peta with me? I doubt Foxface and Thresh even know that he was wounded. All the better if they think he's covering me when I go in for the backpack. But where is it? The arena has lightened enough for me to remove my glasses. I can hear the morning birds singing. Isn't it time? For a second, I'm panicked that I'm at the wrong location. But no, I'm certain I remember Claudius Templesmith specifying the cornucopia. And there it is. And here I am. So where's my feast? Just as the first ray of sun glints off the gold cornucopia, there's a disturbance on the plain. The ground before the mouth of the horn splits in two and a round table with a snowy white cloth rises into the arena. On the table sit four backpacks, two large black ones with the numbers two and eleven, a medium-sized green one with the number five, and a tiny orange one, really, I could carry it around my wrist, that must be marked with a twelve. The table has just clicked into place when a figure darts out of the cornucopia, snags the green backpack, and speeds off. Fox face! Leave it to her to come up with such a clever and risky idea. The rest of us are still poised around the plane, sizing up the situation, and she's got hers. She's got us trapped, too, because no one wants to chase her down, not while their own pack sits so vulnerable on the table. Foxface must have purposely left the other packs alone, knowing that to steal one without her number would definitely bring on a pursuer. That should have been my strategy. By the time I've worked through the emotions of surprise, admiration, anger, jealousy, and frustration, I'm watching that reddish mane of hair disappear into the trees well out of the shooting range. Huh. I'm always dreading the others, but maybe Foxface is the real opponent here. She's cost me time, too, because now it's clear that I must get to the table next. Anyone who beats me to it will easily scoop up my pack and be gone. Without hesitation, I sprint for the table. I can sense the emergence of danger before I see it. Fortunately, the first knife comes whizzing in on my right side so I can hear it and I'm able to deflect it with my bow. I turn, drawing back the bowstring and and send an arrow straight at Clove's heart. She turns just enough to avoid a fatal hit, but the point punctures her upper left arm. Unfortunately, she throws with her right, but it's enough to slow her down a few moments. Having to pull the arrow from her arm, take in the severity of the, room, of the wound, I keep moving, positioning the next arrow automatically as only someone who has hunted for years can do. I'm at the backpack now, my fingers closing over the tiny orange backpack. My hand slips between the straps and I yank it up my arm. It's really too small to fit on any other part of my anatomy. And I'm turning to fire again when the second knife catches me in the forehead. It slices above my right eyebrow, opening a gash that sends a gush running down my face, blinding my eye, filling my blood with the sharp metallic taste of my own blood. I stagger backward, but still manage to send my readied bow in the general direction of my assailant. I know as it leaves my hands, it will miss. And then Clove slams into me, knocking me flat on my back, pinning my shoulders to the ground with her knees. This is it, I think. In hope for Prince's sake, it will be fast. But Clove means to savor the moment. Even feels she has time. No doubt Cato is somewhere nearby, guarding her, waiting for Thresh, and possibly Peta. Where's your boyfriend, District 12? Still hanging on? She asks. Well, as long as I'm, as we're talking, I'm alive. He's out there now, hunting Cato. I snarl at her, then I scream at the top of my lungs, PETA! Clove jams her fist into my windpipe, very effectively cutting off my voice. But her head's whipping from side to side, and I know for a moment she's at least considering I'm telling the truth. Since no PETA appears to save me, she turns back to me. Liar, she says with a grin. He's nearly dead. Cato knows where he cut him. You've probably got him strapped up in some tree while you try to keep his heart going. What's in the pretty little backpack? That medicine for lover boy? Too bad he'll never get it. Clove opens her jacket. It's lined with an impressive array of knives. 
She carefully selects an almost dainty-looking number with a cruel, curved blade. I promised Cato if he let me have you, I'd give the audience a good show. I'm struggling now in an effort to unseat her, but it's no use. She's too heavy and her lock on me too tight. Forget it, District 12. We're going to kill you, just like we did your pathetic little ally. What was her name? The one who hopped around in the trees? Rue. Well, first Rue, then you, and then I think we'll just let nature take care of lover boy. How does that sound? Clove asks. Now, where to start? She carelessly wipes away the blood from my wound with her jacket sleeve. For a moment, she surveys my face, tilting it from side to side as if it's a block of wood, and she's deciding exactly what pattern to carve on it. I attempt to bite her hand, but she grabs my ha the hair on the top of my head, forcing me back to the ground. I think, she almost purrs, I think we'll start with your mouth. I clamp my teeth together as she teasingly traces the outline of my lips with the tip of the blade. I won't close my eyes. The comment about Rue has me filled with fury, enough fury, I think, to die with some dignity. As my last act of defiance, I will stare her down as long as I can see, which will probably not be an extended period of time, but I will stare her down. I will not cry out. I will die in my own small way, undefeated. Yes, I don't think you'll have much use for your lips anymore. Want to blow, lover boy, one last kiss? She asks. I work up a mouthful of blood and saliva and spit it in her face. She flushes with rage. All right, then. Let's get started. I brace myself for the agony that's sure to follow. But as I feel the tip open, the first cut at my lip, some great force yanks Clove from my body, and then she's screaming. I'm too stunned at first, too unable to process what has happened. Has Peta somehow come to my rescue? Have the game maker sent in some wild animal to add to the fun? Has a hovercraft inexplicably plucked her into the air? But when I push myself up on numb arms, I see it's none of the above. Clove is dangling a foot off the ground, imprisoned in Thresh's arms. I let out a gasp, seeing him like that, towering over me, holding Clove like a rag doll. I remember him as big, but he seems more massive, more powerful than I even recall. If anything, he seems to have gained weight in the arena. He flips Clove around and flings her onto the ground. When he shouts, I jump, never having heard him speak above a mutter. What did you do, that little girl? You kill her? Clove is scrambling backward on all fours like a frantic insect, too shocked to even call for Cato. No, no, it wasn't me. You said her name. I heard you. You kill her? Another thought brings a fresh wave of rage to his features. You cut her up like you were going to cut up this girl here? No, no, I... Clove sees the stone about the size of a small loaf of bread in Thresh's hand and loses it. Cato! She screams. Cato! Clove! I hear Cato's answer, but he's too far away. I can tell that much to do her any good. What was he doing? Trying to get Foxface or Peta? Or had he been lying in wait for Thresh and just badly misjudged his location? Thresh brings the rock down hard against Clove's temple. It's not bleeding, but I can see the dent in her skull and I know that she's a goner. There's still life in her now, though, and with the rapid rise and fall of her chest, the low moan escaping her lips. When Thresh whirls around on me, the rock raised, I know it's no good to run, and my bow is empty, the last loaded arrow having gone in Clove's direction. I'm trapped in the glare of his strange golden brown eyes. What'd she mean about Rue being your ally? I, I, we teamed up, blew up the supplies. I tried to save her, I did, but he got there first. District one, I say. Maybe if he knows I helped Rue, he won't choose some slow sadistic end for me. And you killed him, he demands. Yes, I killed him and buried her in flowers, I say. And I sang her to sleep. Tears spring in my eyes. The tension, the fight goes out of me at the memory. And I'm overwhelmed by Rue and the pain in my head and my fear of Thresh and the moaning of the dying girl a few feet away. To sleep, Thresh says gruffly. To death, I, I sang until she died. I say, your district, they sent me bread. My hand reaches up, but not for an arrow that I know I'll never reach just to wipe my nose. Do it fast, okay, Thresh? Conflicting emotions cross Thresh's face. He lowers the rock and points at me almost accusingly. Just this one time, I'm letting you go. For the little girl, you and me were even then. No more owed. Do you understand? I nod because I do understand about owing, about hating it. I understand that if Thresh wins, he'll have to go back and face a district that has already broken all the rules to thank me, and he is breaking the rules to thank me too. And I understand that, for a moment, Thresh is not going to smash in my skull. Clove! Cato's voice is nearer now. I can tell by the pain in it that he sees her on the ground. You better run now, fire girl, says Thresh. I don't know, need to be told twice. I flip over and my feet dig into the hard-packed earth as I run away from Thresh and Clove and the sound of Cato's voice. Only when I reach the woods do I turn back for an instant. 
Thresh and both large backpacks are vanishing over the edge of the plain into the area I've never seen. Cato kneels beside Clove, spear in hand, begging her to stay with him. In a moment, he will realize it's futile. She can't be saved. I crash into the trees, repeatedly swiping the blood that's pouring into my eye, fleeing like the wild, wounded creature I am. After a few minutes, I hear the cannon, and I know that Clove has died, and that Cato will be on one of our trails, either Thresh's or mine. I'm seized with terror, weak from my head wound, shaking. I load an arrow, but Cato can throw that spear almost as far as I can shoot. Only one thing calms me down. Thresh has Cato's backpack containing the thing he needs desperately. If I had to bet, Cato headed after, out after Thresh, not me. Still, I don't sh slow when I reach the water. I plunge right in, boots still on, and flounder downstream. I pull off Rue's socks that I've been using for gloves and press them into my forehead, trying to staunch the flow of blood, but they're soaked in minutes. Somehow I make it back to the cave. I squeeze through the rocks. In the dappled light, I pull the little orange backpack from my arm, cut open the clasp, and dump the contents on the ground. One slim box containing one hypo hypodermic needle. Without hesitation, I jam the needle into Peta's arm and slowly press down on the plunger. My hands go to my head and then drop to my lap, slick with blood. The last thing I remember is an exquisitely beautiful green and silver moth landing on the curve of my wrist. <laughs>